Hi, everyone. If you don't already know, I'm Ron from Ron's Computer Videos, and you are? I am Steve from Mac84. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ron. Thank you for agreeing to do this again this year, and thank you for everybody for sticking around. I know it is rather late. So. I'm very glad your check cleared. Yeah, it's great. I had my people call his people and then write a check to his people, and then everything worked out after that. So money's a great motivator. <laughs> so <clears throat> as my friend Steve Wozniak and his son, uh, Jacob? I can't remember. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> I could just make up. You guys don't know. But it, so anyway, Steve Wozniak, the, speaking of checks that cleared the bank, um, they brought him in for kind of one of these early things. And I've always loved this photo. So I uh, decided to put that here at the top. But who the hell are we, Steve? Yeah, well, we are just two people who are obsessed with old computers because there are some undiagnosed things wrong with our brain. And that's just how it works. Yeah, my things are diagnosed, but my name is Ron from Ron's Computer Videos. You can find all of my stuff online at uh, the Ron's Comp Vids uh, dot various things. So, but we're here today. We're going to just talk to you about 100 series power uh, uh, collecting Macintosh PowerBook computers and how it's for everyone. That's not what it says on the slide, but you're going to trust me on this. So our goals for today are going to be to give everybody the tools that they need to get started with collecting Macintosh 100 series PowerBooks, to break down that 100 PowerBook series by model, talk about maybe how collectible they are, what you might expect to pay, even though probably you guys have already bought some today and who knows what you paid, <laughs> and uh, things to look for when making a purchase. And then kind of at the tail end, we're gonna talk about repairs, must have upgrades, and then we'll do a Q&A here at the end. So show of hands, how many people have a PowerBook 100 series already? Yeah. How many people want one? All right, good. Nice. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, this information is for you. <laughs> oh my. Told you. I thought we were going to get down here and it was going to be like another Avon convention. <laughs> Those guys hated this presentation. <laughs> so let's talk about scope and not the mouthwash. Their check did not clear. <laughs> So we're going to talk about Macintosh 100 series power books made by Apple from the years 1991 through 1994. Steve, what are we not going to talk about? Well, there's the the 190C, which is technically not one of these. That's almost, <laughs> that's almost like a fake 100 series. Yeah, it's a fake. So. We're not talking about the Macintosh Portable because we could fill an hour just on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Duo is sort of its own thing, and the PowerPC ones are its own thing. And uh, the 500 series is a very neat machine, but we're just not covering it here because, again. We could talk about it for hours on that. There's so. literally a five in the front, guys. <laughs> <laughs> if it had a one in the front, we'd consider it, but no. So everyone, I'm going to ask that you think a little different here for the next few minutes as we go through this. If you're familiar with what we did last year, it's going to be largely the same type of uh, presentation. We hope you enjoy it. So, All right. Early power books. So we've got the 100. The 140 and the 170. This was Apple saying, oh, people, you know, like the uh, the clone PowerBook-esque, you know, laptop-esque type things that uh, the other manufacturers did while we were still selling the Macintosh Portable. Let's try and do something like that. A lot of the PC era uh, laptops of the time. And so Apple came out with this lineup in uh, late 91. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I just want to make sure. <laughs> and so this was the first line of Apple's official laptops that they released. And uh, they, they vary quite differently. Uh, the, the 100 is very different from the 140 and the 170. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have built-in floppy drives. Some do not. Good luck finding an external one. Yeah. So they're great little machines. Again, this was just kind of the early days getting things started with Apple. Um, originally, the PowerBooks were going to go by a different name. They were going to be called DynaBooks. And they ended up um, not being able to secure that copyright because a, a like a clone, a PC laptop clone manufacturer had snatched up the name and made a series of very pedestrian sort of laptops. So they were like, "Well, we already like the word book. What's a powerful word that we could put in front of the word book? Power book. You're hired." <laughs> <laughs> so the Power Book One Hundred actually has a very interesting thing. It is very much unlike any other 100 series power book in that um, this was actually a model that was produced for Apple by Sony. Um, Apple had the original Macintosh portable. If you remember, it's a huge monster. It's a big white case, a lot of very innovative ideas, but not very portable, more luggable. And as uh, Japanese clone manufacturers and laptop, sorry, 
system integrator laptop manufacturers were kind of shrinking things down, Apple realized the only way to get in on that market is to have what would almost be kind of like a subcompact kind of notebook. And so they turned to Sony and said, Sony, take this big sum bitch and make it something that fits in a in a briefcase. And they did, and that's the PowerBook 100. PowerBook 100 is based, it's basically sort of like a very fast Macintosh Classic or a Mac Plus, uses the same Motorola or uh, Motorola 68000 microprocessor, but it's 16 megahertz compared to a lot of those other machines, which are just eight. Um, a, a lot of these things, uh, just to save on money, uh, like the PowerBook 100 uses pseudo static RAM, which was really expensive. It was the same type of RAM that was used in the Macintosh Portable. So it's kind of limited to two megabytes. And uh, hard drive options were kind of limited. Like Steve was saying, this is one of the models as an external floppy drive to try to save space and weight. But it does include Apple's proprietary HDI 30 SCSI connection. So instead of having a big DB25 on the back of the machine taking up a lot of space, you have a nice little square. It's kind of, and, and that follows through on all the 100 series power books. You do only get one serial port, but you do get ADB for keyboard and mouse. It has sound out. And then like every other power book in the series has a lead acid battery. Um, everybody else, it's a NICAD. So it was uh, it was kind of nice because this machine lasted a lot longer than some of those early NICAD batteries. And you didn't have like the battery effects or the memory effect on charging the batteries. And this, uh, this model actually even supports something the other ones don't. There are three coin cell batteries in the back that preserve the RAM. So you could actually shut the machine completely down, swap the battery, or I'm sorry, you could put it into sleep. You could pull the system battery put a new battery in, bring it back out of sleep, and your applications and your documents would still be there. I don't know a human that tried that. <laughs> but Apple sale literature said that you could. I, I I think this machine, I had one of these when I was young. I, I thought it was really, really great, but it's got a passive matrix display, which makes it really, really hard to see, especially in uh, in any kind of like less than ideal lighting situations. Yeah. But unlike the portable, it only came as one model with a backlit display, which was kind of nice. Yeah, so two tidbits about this model. If you are repairing one, like I did only a few days ago, and you have recapped all of the caps on the display, and you are starting up for the first time, and you're like, let's see if this thing works, and the brightness knob doesn't work, don't worry. The brightness knob only works once the system is fully booted up. <laughs> so don't go through the, the hassle that I did. Uh, the other thing I want to mention with these systems is, as you're gonna be seeing, as you already saw with like the proprietary SCSI port and stuff like that, these machines were a little bit different than your desktop Macs because they had to fit everything in a package. So an external floppy drive that is a little bit, you know, special and the SCSI port and stuff, you're gonna need adapters and doohickeys to just do some conversions for you when you're working on these systems. So just something that we're gonna to be touching on throughout this presentation is you might see a power brick and like, oh yeah, I, I gotta get that. Oh, wait, I need a power adapter. Oh, wait, I need a SCSI adapter. Oh, wait, yeah, so <laughs> you just want to be aware of that. Yeah, don't nickel and dime yourself on these. A lot of these that you're going to see, especially if it's just like a loose machine, um, you almost might make sure that you ask a lot of questions. Like, what else are you going to include with this? Does it have a power brick? Does it have, um, again, like you were saying, like external floppies and things yeah. like that? Because you can really go broke trying to pick up some of those things later. Yeah, and don't worry about the hard drive. There's now a blue SCSI notebook compatible one. So. Yeah, and we'll talk about a lot of those upgrades yeah. and stuff later, and just Planting making sure. Seeds. Yeah, no, I'm with you, man. Because uh, you gotta you gotta go in aware. <laughs> these are gonna be recurring topics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the 140. So this is this is sort of well, this is a 165C, but it, you can see the form factor is a little bit different. This sort of mirrors like the 140, the 170. You have the, the different design here. You have the flap on the back, but um, this this had the same max RAM. It was a little bit faster than the 100. Uh, these were, I think they were released were, they the same time or like a few weeks apart. They, you yeah, know. but I think um, 100 was absolutely the first thing yeah. out, the, out the door. And then, and yeah. Yeah, I think, and Apple used to do that a lot. They would announce something and then they would release it like over the next few months or weeks. So if you like look at the old Mac magazines, like, oh, they're on the cover. It's like, yeah, well, they were all released like, you know, tidbits along the way. Like, yeah. oh, there's this sales event or whatever. We're really spoiled now where they have the announcement where <laughs> yeah. it's like. They're available today. Yeah, it's like the, the new iPhone 99, it's already in your Amazon cart. <laughs> <laughs> 
so so this one had i think the screen is a little bit better on this although it's still a passive matrix screen uh, has a built-in floppy drive which is helpful although those have their own problems but at least you know you have one from the get-go um again you have the same scuzzy interface the hdi 30 uh, which you can actually still find adapters for a uh, pretty pretty commonly. Yeah. Um, I think you get two serial ports with this one. You get ADB, so you can plug in a keyboard and a mouse if you don't like the trackball. And uh, oh, sound in and out. Ooh, yes. fancy. I know. Both <laughs> both the audios. Yeah. And so the biggest difference between like the 140 and what we're going to go over with, the, like the 170, you're, you're just going to see like processor bumps, maybe memory configurations. And then the LCD is going to change slightly. So, you know, you're going to have your passive matrix and then later on you'll get an active matrix. And what that really means is you're going to have less blurring when you scroll or move windows around. For, for those of you who had not had to put up with those lovely displays, uh, that's really the, the kicker with some of these. You're, even when you recap the display and they look beautiful, there's still going to be lines on them because it's a passive matrix display. Right. But it is um, it is it is really, really great. I do like these machines. That PowerBook 170, chef's kiss. <laughs> it's a really great machine. Um, and what are you going to do with all those megahertz? Up? I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to run some hypercard, I bet. <laughs> but no, it's, um, so they, they kind of, in, in something you'll also see kind of during this presentation is how, um, this seems to be the product line that Apple took the most feedback on and, and made those things actionable, um, items for their design team to address on new models. Because when you're spending $2,500 oh, yeah. in nineties money on a laptop, um, those customers show up with pitchforks and torches. <laughs> they want, they want like whatever that thing is addressed. They're going to buy the next one. They, they already know they're going to buy the next one, but they want the next one to address whatever those problems were previously. So 170 is the top end for that first, that first rollout of PowerBooks. It's a 25 megahertz, 68030. Um, something that is nice about it, unlike the PowerBook 140, is it has a PMMU, so it has memory management, so it does a virtual memory, which was really, really important on those base configurations with two megs of RAM, especially if you're wanting to run like System 7 um, or anything like that, just because like four megs of RAM is almost just a must. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you were really having to juggle your resources, and it's not a lot of fun. You could start up the OS, but you can't run any apps. <laughs> yeah, it's like, man, look at that clock in the menu bar. <laughs> so nice. But uh, this model also includes includes an FPU. Um, it has uh, the same uh, 600 by or 640 by 400 resolution, but in black and white, but it's active matrix. And they are beautiful displays if you ever see one in, per in person. They, um, uh, nowadays they have like some, some sort of like tunnel vision issues and things like that. But um, at the time they were just absolutely beautiful. I just, I can't stress enough how great they were. And then this is also one of the models that um, Apple, um, kind of ended up using as sort of like that higher standard for a lot of stuff going on where it was like, okay, we absolutely have to have an FPU kind of on the top model. We wanna make sure that everything has at least two serial ports, sound in, sound out. So we have like some base desktop equivalency, um, but we're gonna miss a very, very needed feature, which is direct video out. I know a lot of people these days, you absolutely take it for granted that you're just going to like bring a laptop somewhere and plug video in. That was not a stock option on these machines. And that is one of the things that Apple absolutely took a beating on because it's like, this is a laptop for professionals, a lot of salespeople, you travel. Now I need to do a presentation and I can't get it on a display. And so what do we do No, They've got like a scuzzy box that they got to take with them and plug into the machine. And then that hooks up to the projector. I thought this was a laptop. This is supposed to be easy. So Apple did a lot to address that with. Oh yeah. The, the second lineup. Now you may be thinking, wait, why are these numbers going up and down? I'm confused. Everyone's confused. They're power books. <laughs> so if, if you are confused, there's a great website, Mac Tracker, or every Mac, low end Mac, they all have the lists of these power books and the release dates. And you can say, oh, okay, this corresponds to that. That one corresponds to this. There is a very loose like series of these individual ones. So like, obviously like the, the 180 is slightly better than 170 and has video out and stuff like that. But you know, you want to take that with a grain of salt. You want to look it up and don't 
don't get, you know, it's very easy to get confused. So especially when you're like on the show floor buying something like, no, this is a 170 that must be better than the 160. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, like how the numbers bounced around. The um, the numbers on the model numbers of these power books, it's like ordering food at Portillo's. <laughs> it's the number means absolutely nothing. It's like it'll just happen when it happens. It, like you, you've placed your order. You're number five. They call like 275 million, <laughs> and you are just like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like I missed my food. No, no, it's it's cool. They know what's going on conceivably. So, <laughs> but Apple took a lot of feedback from uh, end users and rolled that back into uh, some upgrade models that came out in August of uh, 1982. And the first of which was the PowerBook 145, which uh, more or less kind of um, is a feature, mostly feature equivalent with the original PowerBook 140, but um, kind of addressed a few uh, like repair issues and thing, or I'm sorry, not repair issues, but rather um, some, some pricing issues that people had with the original 140. And uh, so it did have a new lower price, but in terms of actual features, it is, it is more or less on par with the 140. Yeah, the one, 160, um, is it the same speed as the 145? Yeah. Or, okay, mm -hmm. so you got the same speed, but the uh, it's not a, a two, it's not a black and white, it's a grayscale display. Right. So. so you'll see the two megs of RAM, that was, that was absolutely two megs of RAM on that base model. And so 160, they... Yeah, you got, got more memory on that, which is nice. Um, you really like think like, oh, well, four bit grayscale, like really how big of a difference is like, oh, wow, you could actually see like dithering and graphics and like fun stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice upgrade. Um, again, all these screens will need to be recapped and all that fun stuff. But what's interesting is that this model, you can sort of see like where they were going. Like mm -hmm. there there was after this, like they, they would plus these models slightly. So like 160, 165. And then, you know, you can sort of see the path that they were going and they, they got a little bit better with the numbering. But. Yeah, absolutely. I do like um, the the uh, four bit passive matrix, uh, even though it is passive matrix four, four bit grayscale display. That was very much a uh, a gimme to business clients because when you would go out and you'd go places and people want to see a graph. Oh yeah, and it's like the gradients. And yeah, things. it's yeah. like a very sort of uh, kind of pie chart, but in four bit grayscale. It's much nicer, especially you're sitting there with a customer or something just looking over your shoulder. And the 160 is the first model that supported uh, video out. Yeah. And not like a VGA connection on the back. Oh, you not, got a proprietary not a, business here. Exactly. So the thing that sort of looks like HDMI, it's not HDMI. Um, there's a, a PowerBook video cable you get. Again, fairly uh, findable these days because they made billions of them. And they were compatible with a, a laundry list of PowerBooks. But it's this uh, you know HDMI kind of looking port there. And that will convert you to a DB15 or DAE15, whatever it is, uh, port that you know, converts to your Mac and you could always plug VGA into it. But yeah. I think there are a few third party ones as well. Mm -hmm. And the nice part, it's it's uh, eight bit color. So you've yeah. got 256 colors, which a lot of, most importantly, a lot of Mac games uh, really wanted in those days. So when you were done uh, doing your business call, you could fire up a copy of, um, of Prince of Persia or something like that. <laughs> the blow color up, version. Yeah, yeah, the color version of Prince of Persia and blow off a little bit of steam. But this is a really nice machine. I, I really like the 160 a lot. Yeah, and, and what's helpful with the video port these days is if you get one of the bad display or the display, you know, you can't even see anything on it. If you had that video connector, you could sometimes just like get the mirroring out or an extended desktop just to make sure, okay, the system is actually running. Yeah, make sure that it's, it's like if the LCD, you're booting blind on the LCD that you can at least see that there's something else happening. But yeah. Powerbook 180 is the the high end model on this. It's a 33 megahertz 68030. 33, oh my 30 whopping 33 <laughs> megahertz. It has a PMMU, so it's got the ability to do virtual memory, and it has an FPU. Um, pretty much everything else right on par with the 160. Yeah. Um, something to know about these models is Apple had the foresight to think. You know, it's um, as modular and as easy to swap things out on these machines as we can make them would probably be a good thing. So to make a PowerBook one, uh, 160, a 180, um, they settled on a unified motherboard inside and then added what they called the daughter card that had uh, like your uh, ROM and it had your CPU and it had some base memory and things like that on it. So you can actually upgrade and swap some of these things out. So if you have another machine that you're like, eh, just uh, just if I just had this little other thing, 
it's very easy to do yeah, on this, especially on these, these models when there's parts of plenty of like, oh, this one's trash. Well, the CPU works. Yeah, exactly. So this is a cool era. Yeah, this is the era that I like best, Steve. Yeah, I, I love the 180. It's a great machine. Yeah. Oh, we got colorful one. So this one right here, as the plastic creaks as I adjust it, <laughs> is a PowerBook 165C. Ugh. So looks very similar to the other PowerBooks, but it has sort of this like wave on the back of it. So that's sort of a giveaway here. Um, color displays weren't too bad on this one. Uh, the 165C and the 180C look pretty much identical, except for you know the, the labeling on there. Um, got a bit of faster machine. You got a big color, of course. So ooh. A localized thunderstorm upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> External video out, of course. So you have you know your colors. So you could drive another color monitor and stuff like that. Um, I think these did um, extended desktops and mirroring. So yeah. you know that was a big thing that Apple offered with them. And you know you get your standard interfaces that the rest of the other PowerBooks did. But it was a portable color machine, and uh, these were these were really nice. You know the display on these are passive. I think the 180C is the the active matrix one. Yes. But um, again, it just neat machines. And the, and the 180C, um, it's just one of those things that if you get it and it looks like it's a passive matrix screen because there's lines all over, it just needs to be recapped yeah. and look great. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice because these are some of the models where they upgraded the base memory to four megabytes and then raised that memory ceiling to 14 megabytes. That doesn't sound like a lot of RAM, but I will, I will just tell you back in the day, if you had a power book with like eight megabytes of RAM, it felt like you absolutely felt that breathing room and being able to do things on the machine versus like four megs or two megs, especially if you're running system seven. I can open time. up two programs at once. Right, it's absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I just fixed one of these. <laughs> yeah. So, but PowerBook 180C is very much like the PowerBook uh, 165C. The big thing, again, it's an active matrix display. But if you look, you can kind of see, look how large uh, that display is compared to the active matrix display of the PowerBook <laughs> 180C. <bit> <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite small, but it also is 6480 by 480. So it was the first one that you actually had like VGA resolution, something on par with a PC laptop at the time. And the display that they ended up using, I can't remember who makes the display. I think it's a sharp. Yeah, yeah, it's a sharp made. I guess sharp made a lot of the yeah. displays in those machines, but this is an especially nice display if you have one that's a hundred percent working. And these are also the two machines where they change out the power brick just because there are some additional uh, yes. power requirements based on the color displays. So I think they're um, how many watts? Uh, Twenty four. They're 24 watts, and you'll see the difference. The original ones just looks like a standard little barrel plug on the end. The um, These newer ones, or these color models, have um, it'll actually say 24 watts molded into the end of the cable, and the barrel is much smaller. It's much narrower. That will not stop you from <laughs> in your, like, what the hell is going on behind a machine kind of uh, uh, groping to shove one of those in one of your other machines, and it will work. Everything gets really hot, but it will work. <laughs> these are things we've learned over the years. Yes, these are these are our mistakes. Don't make them. <laughs> oh, the 145B, speaking of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Take two. Yeah. yeah. Basically take two of the PowerBook 145, mm -hmm. which I, I think is like one of the few Apple models that ever have like a B in the product title. <laughs> yeah. I think they were like, it was, they realized it was like, we done goofed. <laughs> And so we're going to address some some more customer complaints with these things. But but again, the consolidating this product line, they kind of realized that it's like we are all over the damn road here with model numbers and features and nobody knows what it's like. There's it's like performance, but like smoke colored, like gray, gray performance somehow with just how weird that they did all the model numbers and all that type of stuff. Could you imagine if there were Proforma branded power books? That would be insane. There almost kind of is. <laughs> and we'll talk about that one here in just a little bit. Oh yeah, these are fun. So the, the 145B, I think uh, it's a, what was the original 145 was a 02? No, they're all 68030s. Oh, okay. Yeah. What was the difference? You educate me. I'm not I'm well, not familiar. I have one 145 and it's in pieces. We'll spin back. No, <laughs> I think I think the original 145 is it's it's still one of those ones that it's like um it, it's basically all the same specs as this, but they um they turned around and added like it's got like a slightly different ROM revision. And if okay. you if you know a lot about Macs or you know have passing on or like 
knowledge of Macs. There's a lot of the operating system that's actually kind of built into ROM, like like toolbox calls and things like that. Yeah, the, so, the graphics and the windows and things. Yeah. yeah. So as those machines kind of they replace those series and upgraded things. For, for speed, they would build more and more things into ROM so that way that you could very quickly make those calls or pull those little processes out and it sped up the whole machine. So 145B is basically sort of not so much like a feature bump, but just sort of a like a refining of the 145. Of the I, lower end. Yeah. yeah. So I think if you take them side by side, like a 145B might be like Five percent faster, depending <laughs> on what you're doing, for no real reason. But, but than... HyperCard will run five percent faster, <laughs> and that's really that's really what you want. But you, you'll notice that the, the memory limit is lower. These were these are the lower end products, mm -hmm. so you'll have like your good, better, best, your good, and okay machines, you know, in these timelines. Don't worry, they're all expensive as hell. <laughs> but uh, Apple knew what they. I know what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Here's four thousand dollars. That's what they said. So, but the one sixty five C basically again uh, represents kind non -C. of non C. Oh, I'm sorry. The one sixty five, just the regular one sixty five, um, basically just kind of strips out color. Who and, needs color? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Not if I want to save about a thousand dollars. Uh, I don't need color. But a, again, just strangely drops the FPU and uh and but but kind of mirrors some of that higher ram ceiling and stuff that some of those other models had so um still get video out all that nice stuff you can use all your old accessories you can move your battery you can move a lot of stuff over between these things so i think that um at least apple had a little bit of a concession where it was like we know you're gonna buy the new one i'm sorry we screwed up at least you can move like some of these other invest these other investments that you've made over to this new hardware yeah yeah no oh, no <laughs> the 150 the end of an era this is the 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 tail end of all of our power books Steve. yeah yeah i mean the 150 is a very unique machine because you think oh 150 so that's better than a 145 but in some ways it is not yeah it's kind of a weird one yeah, it it um, whoop, uh, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't have something that uh, every other machine has. Yeah, tell it's, us. Yeah, it's very very strange. Um, the PowerBook 150, and actually, when you were talking about kind of like Performa PowerBooks, this is the Performa PowerBook because this was available at retailers like outside. Because you know you had the Performa line, you'd see that pop up at Sears and Montgomery Ward and and um, like goodies. And, and just weird play, like it's a can of the tire. I don't know. It's just, it's just popping up everywhere with like different weird little models. Well, Apple decided that we need to get our PowerBook series out of the Apple retailer space and we need, or the Apple authorized retailer space and we need to get it into Sears. We need to get it into Montgomery Ward. We need to get it in some of these other places. So the PowerBook 150, uh, ended up for sale at a lot of those weird retailers. They had no idea how to market it. They had no idea what to do with it. You couldn't leave it out on a counter so people could look at it. So basically a lot of them sat behind locked cabinets, didn't sell a whole lot. But this machine uses IDE hard drives. Yep. And this is kind of one of the very first machines that Apple was kind of like, how do we save a little bit of money over buying all these? They're all dead. Um, those, <laughs> those of uh, like 120 gig and, and Meg gig, or Meg. Oh Lord. Uh, uh, <laughs> scuzzy hard drives. And, uh, so, so yeah, so they're like, ah, we'll just throw an ID hard drive in here and see what happens. And they made the slowest damn power book yeah. and, that they and, could possibly make. And you better like that keyboard and trackball, although there's a typo on the slide. There is no ADB port on this. Oh, model. I meant to say no ADB <laughs> port. So, Sorry about so, that. So, oh no not poison oops you know <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so so these 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 machines like if, if the keyboard doesn't work or you have a bad keyboard or the trackball doesn't work well you can't really plug anything else into it so right. and it's very strange because the display is two bit grayscale <laughs> they probably it's, had a warehouse full of these they old probably things. they were just like somebody got on the phone with sharp and it was just like a real like cigar chewing kind of conversation <laughs> to like uh, just tell me what you got. I just don't care. We're, we're sending these damn thing to Sears. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> so they uh, so they crank this thing out. This two bit grayscale display, passive matrix, IDE hard drive, no ADB port, no ability to plug a mouse or anything like that into it. You can actually modify the motherboard to add an ADB port because. What people kind of figured out later when people actually bought, well, the, the five people that bought them, um, 
took them and broke them open, what they realized is while the form factor very much looks like the rest of the PowerBook series, it's largely a PowerBook Duo on the inside with a few modifications. It uses PowerBook Duo RAM. That's why you see a 40 megabyte RAM limit and versus all those other PowerBooks that maybe have 14 at the top end for memory. Um, so you can modify uh, your machine, add an ADB port, use your PowerBook Duo RAM, and and it's still a 150 at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say it's still it's still a sow's ear when you're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they really wanted you to buy the most expensive one. <laughs> they really did. So we said we we're kind of at the end of the era, but why why were we not really going to talk about the PowerBook 190 or the PowerBook 190C? CS, yeah. rather. I mean, it's it's it it came out much later. They I think they used the numbering scheme just to like say, oh well, you know, it's it's lesser than this, but it's it's they didn't want to like introduce a whole new numbering scheme. So something that was sort of familiar, but it's it's not within the same realm of the other series of machines. It looks very different. The internal hardware is very different. Yeah, it's it's very much a PowerBook 150 that's just rebranded or rebadged um because it um it actually is kind of closer to it's it's the replacement for the 500 series but isn't it it's sort of like this like 5300 it's kind of it's like, like the it's, junior model yeah right? it's like a yeah. junior powerbook 5300 because it, it's not is, power pc no yeah. which is literally the worst those 5300s <laughs> are the worst and if you're looking at these and you say what the heck is the difference between the 190 and the 190 cs the the screen quality one's a passive matrix one's an active matrix so and i always forget which one so i always buy the wrong one and go ah poo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. And, but I always mix them up even more. Yeah. <laughs> but they all have exploding lithium batteries, <laughs> yeah, a, <laughs> which is which is a nice touch. I think it's really they are just terrible. But as, the design of them is nice. Like I, I yeah. like like the design of the 190 mimics the design of the, the, the 5300, which is a power PC, one, which is a decent machine. Yeah. Again, if you ignore the exploding batteries. But yeah, if you're into that kind of thing, <laughs> hopefully those are no. long gone by now. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Yes, they they had a recall. They pulled those batteries back, and then they they gave NICADs out. Which, when you when you design a machine for one battery technology, and you make promises about like battery life and things like that, and then you have to fall back an entire generation of battery technology. What do you think that did to battery life? It wasn't <laughs> good things. <laughs> so it made a lot of people that were traveling on the road even, understandably unhappy, even yeah. more unhappy because I, I think also they um, like one of the things with the 500 series is you can have dual batteries, which travelers really, really liked because it yeah. gave you a lot of hours on the plane to do things. And I think that on the um, 190 or something, there's basically like a sabot or something in the other side where there's just it's blocked off where you can't do dual batteries. So people were like, we're like, all right, I'm going to do a bunch of. I'm going to do a bunch of. Damn it, Apple. <laughs> So I think it was of, the same cigar choke, uh, chomping guy who ordered like, the 190. <laughs> how much super glue do you need, Steve? I just we're gonna we're gonna send it all out. I mean, 50 percent of the time it works. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but that's basically that's a rundown of what all the models are. So we're gonna take a few minutes here and we'll kind of discuss some other things about them. Oh, boy. like maybe some <laughs> common repairs. Yes. Because I'm just telling you, you're gonna buy one unless it's been sitting. It's like it was an old lady. She only typed papers on Sundays. Um, it's been sitting in a drawer for 25 years or something like that. That's the only way that you're gonna see one of these where it doesn't need some sort of love to get it back up and running. Yeah, and it's not the fault of anybody who was using it. It's just the plastics degrade. These things are just common issues that a lot of computers have, whether it's aging plastics or components or things like that. But there's there's a lot of stuff that Ron and I have run into with a lot of these machines where it's like, oh, yeah, you should know before you buy it. You should ask these questions before you buy it. And you should just you know be aware that these things exist. Because if you get one, and it looks great. And then you open it up, you hear, well, you know, you, you have some work ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah. LCD hinge joints. That's a yeah. big issue. This one's pretty good. Well, yeah. The, the back. But <laughs> he, do good, it about 10 more times, Steve. <laughs> a good example, you, you will see like the, the plastic sort of popping off a bit. And so the hinges, the, the plastic pieces that are actually connecting uh, the plastic from the front and the back just, you know, sort of get a little loose. But again, super glue will fix that. Um, and you have to know where to look for the screws. There are these little uh, rubber things you could take off. They're, they will turn to goo, but it's okay. Yeah. You could probably 3D print new ones. But yeah, uh, just absolutely. be very careful when you're dealing with these. Um, 
there's guides online of how to take them apart properly and how to service them. Uh, I would not recommend doing that as like your first like recapping or soldering project or anything because mm -hmm. things get very tiny and at and some of these models like I think it's the 160 165 uh, LCD the caps are like three millimeters away from the ribbons that actually make the LCD work so it's like if you slip oops you broke the display so yeah, yeah. be very careful yeah the um, another thing to kind of look for is chassis anchors which um, if you've ever had a power bug and you pick it up and the screws appear to be, there's like three screws on the bottom and they all appear to be in place. But if you pick it up and there's a gap, it's because there are some little protrusions that come down that are uh, sort so the of- screw posts are. Yeah, yeah, they're basically the receivers for the, school, uh, the screw posts and those will snap off. Because you, you gotta have to keep, kind of keep in mind that it's, it's 90s plastic and it's a product that was very portable. People were taking it out, it's in a bag, it's getting jostled. People at the airport are like, Picking it, like it goes behind the thing and the gorilla's jumping on your luggage and all that type of stuff. And Here's another just, power book. Yeah. Right, exactly. So it's they've taken a, a beating over the years, a lot of these machines. So um, chassis breakage is like a really big thing to kind of look out for. But it's um, you had brought up Colin yep. from Does this Not Compute not yeah. um, earlier, and he has a couple of really great videos on how to deal with some of those things. Oh, like, yeah. He's done like, a lot of restoration videos about them. Yeah, that's um, some really good stuff. And there's 3D models out there that kind of replace some of the most common breakages. And I'm working on a thing right now where um, like commonly missing parts. I have access to a laser scanner through work. I'm going to be going through and scanning some of those things. So hopefully people can start printing some of these parts and not having to spend big, buck, big bucks trying to buy like, you know, unique fixer uppers and parts machines to try to just like, all I need is like one little bit of plastic. Yeah. So try to address yeah. some of those things. And, and it's amazing what a 3D printer part and some glue and, and like a replacement screw post will do. Like it will act like, oh, wow, I could open the hinge a hundred times and it won't, yeah. be, they won't be sad, you know? <laughs> Like and and more than anything, kind of um, address some of Apple's original design flaws with um, things like the LCD hinge and all hmm. that. Yeah, and the other thing you have to be careful of is ninety nine percent of the time with the PowerBook models, the ribbon cable either wraps around the hinge or is adjacent to the hinge. So if the plastic breaks and the LCD is no longer really supported, you might rip the little ribbon cable that's very very fragile and delicate. So um, those are very difficult to repair. Sometimes it's impossible to, depending on that. But again, you might be able to find like a replacement screen or something like that that has a cracked screen, but the ribbon cable is okay. So again, you do you want to like look at very detailed like teardown videos of the specific model that you're attempting to repair or look at before you go and open it because even like a few years ago i was like oh, i'll just like open my my power book 145 and oh i just broke like every single screw post where maybe if i was a little more careful and i was like oh you have to remove this first and that first yeah i probably would have got a better shot of it but it was mine so it was okay <laughs> tunnel vision is kind of another big thing yeah. um especially on the active matrix models um, you'll have, uh, you'll, it, everything looks great. Um, you'll leave it on, you'll walk away, you'll come back 20 minutes later. And it's like you're, you're sort of the corners of the screen start getting dark and things sort of kind of start moving towards the middle. You leave it on long enough. You'll just be, it's like watching an old forties <laughs> television. Is where that my just, eyes or the power book? <laughs> right, right. So it's, um, and, and some of that, it just has to do, I think with, um, like moisture, I yeah, think. moisture yeah. getting into the display. So it was a great video by, I think the YouTube channel is the basement and he, uh, he baked, uh, the display in, a, in the oven at a very low setting and it, you know, it resolved the issue, but it, you know, it does come back, you know? Right. So it's, but it's one of those things that the dark runners will creep in, you leave the machine off for a while and they will recede somewhat, but you know, it's not, I don't think there's really like a proven way to fix it completely. You could just sort of like help it a little bit. Yeah. I, I'm no expert on it, but my, my understanding was something that have to do with the lamination of the layers. Possibly. The LCD, yeah. And it just, it, it's, I'm no scientist. 30, either, so. Yeah. 30 years on, it's just sort of like, you just get a little bit of that creep in there. Every, every year we discover new things about these machines. Yeah. Something new breaks all the time, but uh, uh, recapping these again, just to, to iterate, you just got to be very careful. Uh, the capacitors are very tiny. You got to order like three millimeter length capacitors. Very steady hands, you need magnification. It's not fun, but yeah. Something else to keep in mind, every one of these has a dead lithium PRAM battery, um, but do not just remove the battery because there are some models that will intermittently not boot if there is not something bridging that connection between PRAM and whatever else is happening in the system. 
So don't you can leave a dead battery in there. It, it's a CR. It's basically a CR twenty thirty two kind yeah, of yeah, like in a, in a little package with a ribbon yeah. cable. You, you don't want to leave it in like later ones, like a PowerBook twenty four hundred, where it will just eat away. Well, Ask Sean about that. Right. Uh, Aren't just, those are they NICAP? Like the later I, ones, I forget, like some of them are they NICAP. Leave, they leave a nice, pleasant blue powder all over right, the computer. Yeah. All that weird <laughs> ox, <Delicious>. oxidation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about the LCDs. Um, if you use some contact cleaner, like on the little pots that control the, the brightness or contrast sliders, if you're getting like not a connection with that or it's just like very rough, that could sometimes clean it up. Yeah. So they all have dead system batteries. Like, like those NICAD batteries in there are just, they're all dead. That's it. <laughs> Let's, there, ain't, there ain't a little bit. But Ron, I left. should keep the batteries in there for authentic reasons, right? I went to murder you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You can leave it in there. It lives at your house, not my house. I'm not your dad. You do whatever you want. <laughs> but did, I would say get those batteries How did this leak through out. the concrete? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why, why does my computer room look like the end of Superman 3? <laughs> but, um, Two people got the joke. Yes. Yeah, I love Superman 3. That end, that when he melts the computer with that acid from the nuclear or from the nuclear power plant or whatever the power plant. What type of power plant is this? You just got like vats of acid everywhere. The best it's, kind. Yeah, I guess it's the kind where you don't actually show the action. You just have uh, Richard Pryor describe what Superman <laughs> went and did. So he's flying around. Oh, the dude, just show me what he did. I don't. I thought movies were show, not tell. But uh, all the drives are dead. All the drives are dead. If, if they're still alive, it's because um, – because it's dying right now. It's, <laughs> it's going to wait. It's luring you into a false sense of security. So you put like, hey, I got this all loaded up, man. It's ready to go. I'm going to take it somewhere and show it off. And the you're gonna... second you close the plastic. Yeah. The second you, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like the little elves that live in there are just like, that's it. That was our cue. <laughs> Shut it down. Yeah. Thankfully, they are replacement products like the Blue Scuzzy. They have a PowerBook edition. That is great. It fits right in there. And it saves you on battery power and spin up time and all that stuff, too. Absolutely. And then LCD rod. Oh, like yeah. Your screen. Yeah, this one, this was a donation. It's very nice. But uh, there's there's like some pressure points. You'll see it's a little pink. Um, you'll see that in a lot of photos. Um, we're going to give a link at the end of the presentation where I have some examples of like how these things like degrade or whatever. And it's just, you know, it's just sometimes, you know, the pressure was put on it or it was just the way it aged or whatever. And, you know, some are perfectly usable, but hey, has a video out. So if you really want something pixel perfect, you could just feed the video to your favorite monitor yeah. or capture box. And I think some of these things just kind of come with the territory where yeah. it's just like they're all like this. None of them are not like this. And so you just kind of live with it. If you want to, if yeah. you want to be and if part you're gonna of it. going to use the machine, like it's going to get wear. It's like, you know. I, 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 I fix these things to use them. I, I don't like fix them to go like, oh, it's perfect. I'm going to put it in a glass case. Like, what, what's the fun in that? So. Yeah, absolutely. So you uh, you mentioned about uh, Blue Scuzzy actually has some replacement hard drives. For these they things. are here today. They are here. You Be talk, there all weekend. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Eric. Talk to uh, Jay. They have the Blue Scuzzy booth. They yeah. can set you up with these. But I've put it in a couple of machines. It's actually uh, pretty handy. Um, but the weirdest thing about it is, is cause I'm, I'm from the old school of power books. You'd power these machines on and they were so damn loud <laughs> where it was just like, it was just, <laughs> and it was the hard drive and it's, you pull out you put a, you put a, a solid state hard drive in there and it's, it's like, it's like driving a Prius for the first time. <laughs> like you're just like, something's wrong. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it, but I can't hear it working. Yeah, you can hear the speaker pop like when it yeah. initializes, and that's the only like you, end of the screen comes on. You're like, oh, it's alive. You actually, it's if you really, really listen, if you're maybe a young person, maybe, but if you kind of listen, you can hear like the inverter. <laughs> yeah, it whines. You yeah. can you can hear the <laughs> whine of the inverter, which I never heard before. And I'm like, what? Something's wrong. It's like going somewhere on a road trip with your family and you hear some crinkle in the back seat, and it's because one of your kids has got like individually wrapped MMs. But you're like, you're like, what is going on? Transmission I need again. to be able to hear to know if there's something wrong with the vehicle. I am turning this car around right now. <laughs> but no, the Blue Scuzzy is absolutely amazing. Really, really a game changer. Uh, the other thing that's a big game changer on this too is uh, modern RAM replacements oh, yeah. for these machines. Silicon Insider, who's based out of uh, out of France, of Fran yeah. France. <laughs> um, makes RAM replacements uh, for these machines. And not just like the, um, actually, I think just right now, it's just like 
anything that will use like 140, 170 um, sort of compatible RAM, so like 160, 180, kind of those machines. I don't think he makes RAM for the color models yet, just because the um, kind of the orientation of how the RAM has to fit in there. Oh, yeah, it's like a zigzag type. Yeah, because yeah. if you break open, Steve, just go ahead and break open <laughs> your uh, 165. Here, let me help. <laughs> <laughs> right up the front of the desk. Um, but the um, if you look inside, actually, Apple had, there's a motherboard, there's the daughter card that actually has like, you know, processor, FPU, things like that, ROM, all that. Apple on those, those some of those other machines, there's now a cousin card. Hey, cousin. Exactly. And so the cousin card actually would have like some RAM and some other logic and stuff on it as well. But now that you've stacked this sandwich of stuff up inside the machine, the RAM has to do this wacky zigzag to get around all these connectors inside <laughs> there. So I don't think he's made RAM for it yet, but it is coming. Um, but Powerbook 100, he's got modules that go all the way up, max it out. Same thing for like 140, 170, 180, all those type of things. So really, really great. And you the Blue's because he has Wi-Fi now too. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot about that too. So it's so you've got networking and everything else and way cool. <laughs> Make your Powerbook 150 usable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Drake, if you know Drake with uh, Satanic Mac Club, uh, they're talk he's talking about uh, doing more of like – a broader service to be able to sell replacement NICAD batteries for these Ooh. machines. So he sent me a couple. They last a good long time. Um, but it's funny because the Mac and the operating system and the power management hardware and everything that's built into these machines um, at first has no idea what to do with a battery <laughs> that is much, much higher uh, like capacity capacitance yeah. than these original batteries. So you plug it in and it'll say, your computer is 100% charged. Your computer is critically low. It is going to turn off right now. Sorry, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Now we good. 19 and a half hours. <laughs> okay, a, a, addendum six minutes. And, and it'll bounce like that until it kind of like stops sliding off its cracker and figures out exactly what it's going to do. And then and then it'll be like, oh, yeah, that's that's really great. It'd be like 12 hours or something, you know, if it can go to sleep it mode and do all again. that other. Yeah. Yes. Which really opens up the whole world. So if you have a power book that doesn't have any sort of real problems other than other than storage RAM and battery, I don't know what else could go wrong. If you can you can replace these things relatively inexpensively these days and get those machines back up and running. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. So Steve, very quickly, <clears throat> fire round. If um, <laughs> Steve, if I was to ask the dad from the Richie Rich movie, uh, another drug for old people. Uh, if I was to ask him, what um, what power books would you collect? What well, would you say? I would say the one. They've already read the, the one. Already, well, they've already read the, the list, 160 and the 180. The 165 and 180 are solid machines, and then you just add color to the 180, and it's like, yay! Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Uh, I picked a dark horse. I picked the PowerBook 150. <laughs> That's because you like pain and suffering. And, that, and let me tell you why. I think the PowerBook 150 is, um, it's it's not well loved. So people have those and they want to get rid of them because they're like, oh, it's got IDE drives and it doesn't have um, ADB and it's only got sound output and it's got a lot of limitations, but something that it has working for it is the layer, the, the, the complexity of the machine mm -hmm. greatly reduced yeah, yeah, and will just use off the shelf IDE hard drives. So you can get one of the, like a uh, uh, Cullen, like DOS dude yep. one um, actually produced some uh, like IDE SSDs for Macs. And so you can grab one of those relatively inexpensively, a 32, it's it's weird, like a 32 gigabyte, you ain't going to use all of it, <laughs> but you can pop that baby in there and it just sees it and it just works. Or you can get those um, IDE to M.2 adapters, plug one of those in there, it's two and a half inch, it just works. So you can format it and away you go. And once you get a solid state drive in there, if you have one of these nice uh, new batteries, oh, um, yeah. you Less can, for hours. and you can pick up... Um, uh, duo RAM pretty oh, inexpensively yeah. sometimes it makes for a really nice little Mac um, and, and and that two bit color and having a like a, the passive matrix display it's like the power requirements are less yeah. it's it's great to just take on the road to do little things yeah. like especially if you're like I've got a quick take 100 or a quick take 150 and I you got to have a Mac to download that stuff yeah. 
it's perfect. It will just run forever doing those type of little tasks. Yeah. So, and these are machines. That are, and we go to the next slide of the ones that you know we're. we're I am not sad done about. talking about my You're selections. You're going to talk for an hour about I know. your selection. Okay, so Power Book One Hundred and Seventy, really, really great. I, it's great. It's the original thing, and then I absolutely agree with Steve yeah. about the One Hundred and Eighty C. And and again, these these are like just recommendations, looking at the whole spectrum of it. Obviously, if you have a good deal on one, then why not and just pick it up? And yeah. you have you have a spare of one that's maybe not as good, but you know there's such you know small delineations of like what makes good, better, best. Have you seen during this presentation? But yeah, avoid the 100 because the capsule leak on the main board and the LCD, which is fun. I had a cap blow up on me the other day, so yay! I have to fix that. Um, 140, eh, 150. I know Ron loves it, but. I'd, if it was a choice between like that and the 165, I would take the 165. Absolutely. Um, I also say avoid the PowerBook 100 just because I have a lot of fond memories of it, having owned one back in the day. But they're they're not very great, and um, they have a lot of limitations. And I just yeah, you if know, you had to pick one, you know? <laughs> yeah, if I had to pick one, you absolutely had to eliminate it. Say PowerBook 100, PowerBook 140 as well, just because it's very very underpowered. Um, and actually, for whatever reason, they're tougher to find, seemingly, because it's um, a lot of people have those 140s and dumped them and got 145Bs and stuff that just address those like that low RAM issue and all that type of stuff, too. And then absolutely avoid the PowerBook 190 <laughs> and a 190C because it's not a 100 series power book. <laughs> this is the hill I die on. <laughs> But Rana has a 100. Oh, don't hit me. <laughs> I'm seeing if you can kill people with your mind. Hold on. Give me, give me just a second. You're going to kill the power book. Yeah. And that's really it. That just kind of gets us through the, the bulk of the presentation. If you guys have maybe some few questions, we'd love to answer them. Alan. I have a question about recapping. Yes. What are maybe some best practices, do's and don'ts, good techniques for that? Yeah, so you want to get a, a good quality soldering iron. I use a, I think it's a Kassiger. However you say and pronounce that is up to you. Gesundheit. I mean, you chew on the cigar a little bit. That's the sound it makes. But um, You want uh, an iron that, that you could actually like control the temperature pretty well, like the dollar store ones or the ones you have from Amazon. I'm not going to cut it. Um, you probably want a, a soldering iron tip that's a like a, a curved one at the end of it, uh, just because when you're recapping the LCDs, um, you really need, there's like a little plastic surrounding where the caps are because they really didn't want you to do anything to it. And you just you need, really need to like snake around it. You need some magnification. Uh, a heat gun is sometimes useful. Um, but really, if you have a, a good quality iron, a good pair of tweezers, and you're, you're using good quality flux and everything, you probably, as long as you have steady hands, there's a lot of caveats to this, you could probably get away with it without a hot air gun. Because again, if you're at the LCD level, like you don't want to put a lot of heat like against things. So you could delaminate things and do all sorts of nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, don't make it your first soldering project. Uh, yeah. our, our friend Bruce of Branker's Creations has a great like beginner's guide to soldering video. And it's like one of the, the best things to do is just like get like a $10 kit off Amazon and just practice, practice, practice. Don't do not do it on an old crusty machine that's going to have dirt and cap juice all over it. Yeah. Something else to keep in mind, though, is on those uh, 100 series power books, um, with the exception of the power book 100, the motherboard, the daughter card and the cousin card all have tantalum caps. Yeah. There is nothing to replace on the motherboard or any of those other boards on those machines. Yeah, I think the Duo is the exception. Obviously yeah. not in the 100 line, but right. yeah, the Duo has a lot of caps on it. To replace. Yeah, the um, but absolutely like the uh, the LCD display and the inverter, uh, the inverter board, the, the inverter board has one cap on it. Yeah, one or two. And usually they don't go too bad. But if you if you can't get the brightness or contrast to stick right and you cleaned those sliders and that doesn't do anything, then you have to replace the caps. Yeah. And, and on the LCD itself, they like to trick you where there are some models that it will actually look like it is a, thank you, do not disturb. Um, <laughs> there will actually be, a, it will look like a tantalum cap in there, but it's oh, actually yeah. just the a old Newton trick. electrolytic cap, but it's in a tiny plastic box. I don't know why they did that. Just it looked cooler. Maybe it might've been for a pick and place thing. Cause those are oh, very, maybe, very yeah. tiny, tiny parts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They did on the Newton message pad. Yeah, but the, the PowerBook 100 uh, LCD is like that. You have a bunch of these little caps and you think, oh, the positive this way. Negative. No, they're just it, they're just the little through holes that are in that little package. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I know it's not a popular technique, but I like to decapitate the caps. Oh, decapitate, cut decapitate. them. Yeah, decapitate. I mean, 
if you have a, a, a pair of flush cutters and again, practice on something dead, please. It's it's not my preferred method on it's like last resort. Like I can't get a tool in there. Otherwise, you don't want to twist and pull. I know that's controversial, but you know, these things are like 30 years old and they're, right. they're weak and they could just rip the traces with you. So yeah. you don't want to do that, especially if it's on like your prized possession of a power book. I'd say it's um, humidity plays a, a big oh, role yeah. in that too. Yeah. So you start twisting around on things, you pull pads off. You and then it's one more repair you have to do. <laughs> yeah. So why cause yourself a lot of grief? Just, you know, be gentle with all that stuff. Any additional questions? Yes, sir. It sounds like you guys actually use these machines like, for productivity and stuff. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. We have a special brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I actually, um, like when I, um, like if I'm going to do power book, or I'm sorry, uh, hypercard development or something like that, I'll just use a power book yeah. just because I, mean, I can go anywhere and do it. Yeah. It's black and white and the screen resolution is just slightly bigger than a classic Mac. So you can, um, you can actually see and kind of have like the, um, there's probably a proper term for it, but like the safe zone, uh, yeah, you can yeah. kind of develop your stuff in and, and be outside of that. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the good thing about a power book is if you don't have a lot of room and you want to actually run the Mac software on actual Mac hardware and not outside of an emulator, because a lot of the emulators are like a little bit wonky with graphics or sound or anything like that. Power book is a good way to do that without getting a, an extra keyboard or a mouse or like power adapter things. Or I mean, they each have their own things. Oh, you need a special power adapter this and you need a special SCSI converter or whatever. But if you don't have space for it, you know, they could actually be pretty good as a desktop replacement if you have enough memory and stuff like that. Yeah. So you, you get to work off it using the wireless on the blue SCSI card? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's uh, right now it's it's very interesting because there's like a lot of development in that space. So check the Blue SCSI website. There's new firmware updates like pretty frequently. And it's really exciting the cool stuff that they're doing. So yeah, the Wi-Fi is like brand new. I'm not gonna say that the new version of Blue SCSI is going to um, rip, uh, fix all of your L C D problems. But since Eric is at the back of the room, I'm not going to say that it's not going to fix all of your LCD problems either. It's going to be great. Wait, it'll just be a firmware update. <laughs> Any additional questions? Yes, sir. Let's say I'm on eBay. I <laughs> yeah. buy it immediately yeah that's a collector's item <laughs> yeah also just a tip like for ebay if you're buying a power book or anything and this goes for anything vintage but like be detailed about how you want it packed because they'll just like i'll throw a newspaper in it and it just arrives in worse shape those plastic yeah. posts will not know what hit them mm -hmm. no it's um actually i bought an, a number of uh, power books just in a box from a recycler and uh, the ones on the outside were amazing padding for all the ones in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just like, I opened up the, the box and just like power book colored smoke just came out. Delicious. And then I was like, I oh, put on some gloves and avoid the shards and get those the outside ones out. And then everything in the middle was okay. And then, yeah, the ones on the bottom were just like more dust. So... And uh, just a, a tip about the AC adapters, like uh, the PowerBook 500 series has a very odd like AC adapter that can be like stupid money on eBay. Um, don't buy them because they probably don't even have a multimeter to test the voltage of them. Yeah. And they're they're all going to probably need servicing. But yeah. if you do buy like an adapter secondhand, like make, make sure they buy a $10 multimeter and test the voltage of it. Because some people are asking silly prices for these adapters. And like, I think there was an auction that was like $300 for like 12 different adapters and they're yeah. all as is. Mm -hmm. And then you saw their previous auctions were all the power books that went with those adapters. Yeah. So it's like, hmm, I wonder why they didn't include them. Either they didn't work or whatever. And they could also fry your machine if they're out of voltage, out of spec. So you just yeah. want to be careful. I was double dipping. Come on, it's the only way to make money. It's the only way to make money in doing this. But actually, the PowerBook 500 series, if, if we get outside the scope of kind of what we were talking about. Sorry. If, if, no, it's all right. If you go to ronscompvids.com and you go to my, um, what's that website that I use incorrectly, but everybody gets on my case about it? Thangs? No. <laughs> no. The other website that I use incorrectly and everybody gets on uh, my case about it. It's a long list, Ron. It's, um, it's it's where people programmers oh. they put all their program stuff. Oh, the GitHub. Thing. Yeah, the GitHub. I use GitHub. I the put GitHub. all. Yeah, the GitHub. It's like the eBay's. Um, <laughs> the, I, I like YouTube's. Using, I like using the GitHub's, and I put all my three D models and stuff like that out there, and like PCB projects and all that type of stuff. And I actually have a. Um, it's called the Blackbird adapter, and it's um, it is for the PowerBook five hundred because the PowerBook five hundred power supply is like extremely simple. It's two. Uh, 
Good God, who knows why they did this. Two 16-volt power supplies side-by-side side in one box just cooking itself to death. Two are better than one. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so the idea was is it need a little bit more extra power because it's a 68040 machine. So there is like one rail that charges the battery, and there's one rail that powers the machine. And if you're doing something serious on the machine, it pulls off the battery to supplement that other 16 volt rail. So just get the wattage up and everything. But I made an adapter that actually just sits there and you can just use like those cheap power bricks that come with like sound bars. And it's just, you just use a couple Berg connections and just <laughs> plug it in the back of the machine or not Berg, sorry, but- um, The thing, um, the or, thing. Or DuPont, oh. use like DuPont connections and just Stick it in the back of your machine, and you can play with your power book all your time. Yeah, and we have a link on the next slide, I believe. Uh, uh, and then there's uh, yeah. there's a bunch of links here. Yeah, We're learn gonna... learn more about those things. You'll see the slide at some point. And and we'll post this on our social media, like the deck, so you could. And when they yeah. do the recording and everything, they'll they'll share it. But uh, this QR code, I'm building sort of just like a little website that goes over a lot of like the repair stuff we mentioned, and I'll also link to Ron's stuff that he has, like these little adapters and things, and it just you know stuff I've learned while repairing these things. And if you don't get a chance to take a picture of this, just find me in the hallway. Say, hey, where's that thing? I will I will happily show you the QR code. Great. But, yeah. yeah, you can definitely, you can scan there so you can follow the link. Uh, Steve's updating that all the time with new information and things that we kind of think about and all that as part of the presentation, but. Oh, that it just ends. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, so thank you very much for spending, as I often say when I close videos out, thank you very much for spending part of your Saturday evening with us. Um, you have lots of choices when it comes to um, <laughs> presentations at VCF Midwest, and we're glad that you enjoyed ours. Yeah, thank you. Unless you wait, un unless you didn't, in which case we're action retro. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, everyone.